Okay, today is 25 February 1993. We are in the uh, OEOB room 450 for a press conference. Uh, camera number four, this is an open event, Elkins and Hager. CEO Labor Press Conference. States and the Vice President of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here. Uh, this is quite an unusual event because today we have distinguished leaders from America's business community across a, a wide uh, spectrum of uh, industry and business, joining with uh, leaders of the labor community in America uh, to all endorse uh, President Clinton's economic plan. Some of the businesses and industries uh, represented here will be adversely affected by one tiny part or another of this plan, but all of them are joining together in expressing support for the plan itself because they know that all of them, including our, and our entire country, will be helped by the whole plan. It is a tangible sign of how our nation is coming together and uniting behind President Clinton's plan. I would like to, rep to uh, introduce uh, very briefly those who are gathered here, and then I'm going to uh, call specifically on five who uh, I will uh, introduce after this to come and make brief comments. And then we have a special guest who will make uh, comments, and then the President uh, will respond. I'd like to introduce John Belk, Chairman and CEO of Belk Stores, Owen Bieber, President of the United Auto Workers, John Bryan, Chairman of Sarah Lee Corporation, uh, August Bush, Chairman and President, Anheuser-Busch, Emma Chappell, Chairman and CEO of American Airlines, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Bob Bob Crandall, <laughs> Chairman and CEO of an important company that has a hub in Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> Robert Denham, Chairman of Solomon Brothers. <clears throat> Emma Chappelle and United Bank of Philadelphia and an expert on uh, com community uh, Banks, uh, an important component of the President's uh, plan. Um, Ed Gardner, Chairman and CEO of Soft Sheen Products. Keith Geiger, President of the National Education Association. Bob Georgine, President of the Building and Construction Trades. Joseph Gorman, Chairman and CEO of TRW. Gerald Levin, Chairman and CEO of Time Warner. Hugh McCall, Chairman and CEO of Nations Bank, Richard McCormick, Chairman and CEO U.S. West, Gerald McEntee, President of uh, AFS AFSME, John Reed with Citibank, John Scully, Chairman and CEO Apple Computer, Al Shanker, President of American Federation of Teachers, Leslie Wexner, uh, Chairman, The Limited, Bruce J. Bruce Llewellyn, President and CEO of the Philadelphia Coca-Cola Bottling Company. Lourdes Miranda, Chair, President and CEO of Miranda Associates. And now um, the first of the five uh, uh, brief speakers uh, representing this group. Lod Cook is Chairman and CEO of ARCO. He has been doing his part for a long time, for example, by leading the Rebuild Los Angeles effort, and he is also national chairman of Junior Achievement, Lod Cook. Here you go. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. President, let me begin by saying how much I appreciate the opportunity to comment on the economic package you have offered the nation. 
My remarks concern the two sections of the proposal that most directly impact ARCO, the energy tax and the corporate income tax increase. First, we all agree that the growing federal deficit is a threat to the welfare of the nation and especially to its future. In a very real sense, it amounts to taxation without representation for future generations, our children and our grandchildren. It saps our financial strength and puts us at a disadvantage in global markets. Second, considering the challenges and complications that this issue represents, we believe that the President has proposed an even-handed plan that promises to reduce federal spending and accomplish real deficit reduction. No one wants to pay more taxes, but it's clear that we must begin paying for today's needs today and quit borrowing against the future. Third, the concept of a BTU tax on energy and an increased corporate income tax are essential to the success of the President's plan, and we support them. A broad-based energy tax must be made as simple as possible to ensure fairness and to minimize the cost of collection. We have long held that expanded energy taxation is necessary to encourage conservation and reduce pollution. Both are important goals in their own right. Properly designed, the tax the President has proposed will accomplish these objectives. Finally, we believe that the President has faced up to the economic problems of our nation. He's taken a gutsy step and deserves our support. In a very positive and persuasive way, he has sent a signal to the world that America is serious about putting its economic house in order. Mr. President, we applaud your efforts and wish you success. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Cook. In Tennessee, they would say that's strong as horseradish. <laughs> that was really well said. Lane Kirkland, the president of the AFL-CIO, uh, is used to talking to business across the table. But it's, this is not the first time he has stood in the interests of our country, standing side by side with the business community in America. And it is a great honor to introduce Lane Kirkland. Taken as a whole, President Clinton's economic plan sets the country on the right course toward the future. The AFL-CIO endorses it, and we pledge to help see it through the legislative process. Along the way, we will, of course, make certain that the concerns of working Americans are properly addressed. The President's program will reorder the government's priorities so that Americans can begin investing in the future again. At a time when unemployment remains high, when American industries continue to shed jobs, and when recession continues to batter millions of working families, the plan provides the necessary short-term economic stimulus that will put people back to work. It also takes the long overdue step of revising the tax code so that the people who benefited from the tax cuts of the 1980s will pay their fair share of reducing the deficit that was largely created by those cuts. Our members know that there has to be a restraint on spending. They are aware of the need for new revenues. But they want the government to play an effective role in a variety of areas, and they're ready to make a contribution to see that it has the means to do so. As the FLCIO Executive Council noted in last week's policy statement, federal employees are being asked to bear a disproportionate burden, and we have pledged to help find a suitable alternative to the proposed federal pay freeze. But in its large purpose, the Clinton economic plan is right for America, 
and provides the leadership that this country so desperately needs. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kirkland, for that excellent statement. Red Poling is chairman and CEO of Ford Motors. He's been with Ford since 1951, and he has been, among other things, in the forefront of the effort to focus our national attention on the health care crisis. It is a pleasure and honor to introduce Red Poling. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I think we all sense in the country a need for a fundamental change in the way the nation's business is conducted. Americans want to help, and yet they are concerned over the possible impact on their lives. The far-reaching economic plan that the President has presented to the people pres prescribes some tough medicine for America's economic ills. Americans want those uh, new proposals to be studied, analyzed, debated fully, modified if appropriate, and most importantly, acted upon promptly if this plan is to start a process of renewal for our country. I believe President Clinton brings a fresh perspective to many of the problems confronting the nation. We are encouraged that your administration is seeking to work more closely with all businesses, big and small, and with representatives of organized labor as partners to improve America's competitiveness. Just like many Americans, I'm concerned that the proposed tax increases could limit the economic recovery. As the legislation is debated, it is essential that spending cuts be approved at the same time as the tax program. And I'm glad that the President reinforced that point this week. The American people want a low-cost, high-efficiency government. They want value for their tax dollars, just as customers want value in the goods and services they buy. Americans will accept paying more in taxes if they believe the burden is shared evenly and if the budget deficit really goes down. They will not support a budget where added taxes are not appropriately balanced by sizable cuts in spending. This economic plan will not please everyone. But I believe that a nation in which all sectors work together as partners can solve its problems in ways that are as effective as they are fair. We in business should stand ready to work with the administration and Congress to help, sharing our experience where it applies, our strengths where they are needed, and our support where it's appropriate. The President has made the first move. The nation cannot afford to miss this moment for action. Thank you for an excellent uh, statement, Mr. Poling. Catherine Thompson is chairman and CEO of Catherine Thompson Development Company, a nationally recognized home builder based in Orange County, California. It's an honor to introduce Catherine Thompson. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, the American people are encouraged by your bold economic package. We know, however, that you can't accomplish the twin goals of spending cuts and economic stimulus without the help of Congress. Both Republicans and Democrats must join together to cut spending and to pass your economic package as soon as possible. I'm very pleased today to announce to you that the National Association of Home Builders passed a resolution just this past week supporting completely your package. When Americans took the leap of faith to elect the Clinton-Gore ticket, they had the trust and the confidence that they would see the leadership necessary to change government. And we have seen that revealed to us just this past couple of weeks. Now, I challenge the banks of America to have the same trust and confidence and Americans to free up credit. <laughs> when I started my business 25 years ago, I had no tangible assets. If the banker had not looked at my character and the good that my business would provide for the community, I would not be standing here today as a business person. Over 7,000 families live in homes I've built, 
thousands of suppliers, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, and countless support business have benefited from my business. Today, after 25 years, banks say they can't lend money to build the American dream, even though there's a demand for it, because of the regulations. The harsh formula for bank lending for construction has paralyzed our economy and caused the loss of thousands of jobs. Mr. President, we endorse your package completely. We hope that the regulations will change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine Thompson. Jim Jones is more than familiar with the problems we're facing. When he served in the Congress representing Oklahoma, he was chairman of the House Budget Committee. Now and for the last several years, uh, he is the chairman of the American Stock Exchange and the American Business Conference. It's a pleasure to introduce a longtime friend, Jim Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Vice President. Mr. President, as the Vice President pointed out, I have two reasons for strongly endorsing and supporting uh, the President's economic package. Uh, those who covered the budget debates in the early 1980s when I was chairman of the House Budget Committee uh, perhaps remember the warnings that I made at that time that you cannot live a fool's dream and have it all and not have to pay for it. Well, the time to pay for it is clearly past due. And I think the President and the administration uh, should be commended by all Americans in both parties uh, for taking the strong steps that have been taken so far. Uh, the second reason is my more recent career in the financial services industry and representing a group of high growth uh, mid-sized companies. Now, these companies need capital and capital is in shortage. These companies need to know that there will be sustained economic growth so that they can take the risks and get the rewards of being able to sell their goods and services. And that's what's at stake in this economic program. There's criticisms about it. There are a lot of people who say they could do it better, do it differently, and all of us have ideas. But the fact of the matter is we have been hearing criticisms for 10 years and doing nothing about it. The delay has been much too long, and good ideas or criticisms should not be an excuse for delaying this program. In my judgment, this program needs to move quickly. The financial markets are looking uh, very perceptively at this. And uh, we need to move Congress. It should be a bipartisan effort. It's a shared sacrifice program. It's not the be all end all, it's the first step, but the most important first step at reducing this deficit that's been taken in the last decade. So I strongly support it from a point of view of the business that I'm now in, but even more importantly, I support it from the standpoint of a father who has two sons, Hopefully we'll have grandchildren someday, and it's our duty to pass on to them a country that has the same kind of opportunity that we inherited. And until this moment, I could not have said that we would be doing so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. We have one other speaker before the President responds to all these endorsements of his economic program. Those who have spoken thus far are business leaders and labor leaders. One of the audiences, obviously, is the Congress of the United States. One group within the Congress with a special and unique perspective is the group elected for the first time when the President was elected. They come with the same uh, experience of having communicated with the voters during the crucible of this past campaign year, and they have been studying this plan very carefully. It is one of the most impressive group of freshman members of Congress ever sent to Capitol Hill, and they elected as their leader the Congresswoman from North Carolina, Eva Clayton. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. President, I have come to present a letter authorized by the new members of the Democratic Party, of the Democratic uh, freshman class. Uh, we want you to know that we stand ready to support you. 
We are encouraged by your boldness and your visionary method of bringing both the stimulus, the, uh, the budget cuts, as well as the investment in the future. We think America needs that kind of bold uh, acknowledgement of its problem. Further, we think Congress needs to get rid of the gridlock. And the freshman class is going to set the example by saying that we are ready to work with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much to all the business and the labor leaders who are here and to Representative Clayton and uh, the many members of the House uh, whom she represents so ably. Uh, let me begin with a simple thank you to all of you for your support of our common efforts to turn our country around and put our nation on the right track. For too long, uh, we have seen business and labor divided over more issues than we see them united on. Part of that uh, has been occasioned by the incredible difficulties of our economy. When people believe there is a shrinking pie, they're more likely to be fighting over that. Part of that has been occasioned by the fact that we have not been on a great national journey together in which we could all feel that we were apart, making our equal contributions, reaping our equal rewards. I'm very encouraged by the business-labor partnership that we see manifested here today, by the fact that it represents a commitment to ending gridlock and to beginning change, and deeply impressed by the letter which Representative Clayton has brought here today, by the people whom I think in many ways are most representatives of the American people, this new big class of freshmen, uh, congressmen and women, we're out there just as uh, Vice President Gore and I were last year, crisscrossing the country uh, in a beginning effort, listening to people and their concerns and their hopes. So I'm very, very happy about that. Uh, if I might, I'd like to close just by emphasizing three or four of the critical elements of this economic plan and why I think they are worthy of the support of this distinguished group of Americans. Everyone knows we have to bring the deficit down. It has become the dominant fact of all uh, the budgeting of the federal government. But there are those who say, well, how can you do that? You're just coming out of a recession. And traditional economic theory holds that the last thing you want to do is to slow down a recovery by closing a deficit. That is, for ever since the Depression, our country has operated on an economic theory that said that when times were slow, there should be more government spending. When times were great, then you could bring our accounts into balance. The problem is that for more than 20 years, we have been building in a structural deficit into our government, one that robbed the national government of that flexibility, the flexibility to tighten up in good times to slow down inflation and to invest more in bad times to put people back to work. And our strategy now, I think, is actually supporting an economic recovery and bringing this deficit down because you can see the decline in long-term interest rates, which means that borrowing is cheaper and which means that millions of Americans in their personal capacities and as business persons are going to refinance their debt, which will free up cash to be reinvested in economic growth. So I believe this strategy is expansionary. I also would make a couple of other points, if I might. We are changing fundamentally the direction of government spending itself, moving away from spending for consumption towards spending a higher percentage of the people's tax dollars on investment. It is simply not true that all government spending is equal. Some investment will have a much bigger reward in terms of jobs and incomes than spending more money on the same programs. And finally, we are looking at ways to basically make the government itself work in a very different and more efficient way. One of them has already been alluded to by Catherine Thompson. We will be announcing uh, in the near future some efforts by this administration to ease the credit crunch on small business. We are also trying to change the way the government itself operates in the regulatory framework to do things that will achieve objectives in a better way. We believe we can promote a clean environment and economic growth with the right kind of regulatory and investment climate. We believe by changing the way the government itself 
does business, we can give the American people a much leaner government. We think that the White House staff cuts and the reorganization are simply an example of what we can do throughout the government given time. So I appreciate the support for this program. And let me reiterate, I am not simply interested in raising more revenues. I don't want new taxes unless we are going to have spending cuts, unless we are going to change the nature of government spending toward more investment, and unless we're going to change the way the government itself operates. This is a whole program that will fundamentally give us an end to gridlock and the change we need. And I thank these people who are here. They are reflective of the kind of unity we need in America to move this country forward. Thank you very much. How committed, sir, are you to the stimulus part of your package? It's now been delayed another month, perhaps. Your budget is not even going up until April 5th. Uh, a lot of economists say that if it gets delayed much longer, it won't even help the economy. Not only will well, you of the preceding speakers even mention the stimulus package, just how important is it? Oh, yes, that's not true. At least one of them did mention it first. And secondly, uh, I think it is quite important. For one, I think it would be a big mistake. Let me just give you. It will do what it's designed to do later in time for, for everything except those things that have to be in place this summer. And I'm hoping that we can get uh, the kind of – a lot of the members of Congress are looking for a way to demonstrate to the country that they don't want to raise more taxes without cutting spending. And we're trying to – we're working on giving them an opportunity to do that. I agree with that. I think that's fine. But there are some things that are time sensitive in this stimulus package. The most obvious and apparent one is the summer jobs program. Uh, and nearly every person I know, uh, including an enormous number of business people who are in and around cities like Los Angeles or Chicago or New York or other cities, uh, believe that the prospect of being able to provide nearly 700,000 summer jobs in a framework in which we could then get business people together to work to provide more jobs, and one of the people here on this platform today has already told me that he wanted to get involved in that, could be a major statement this summer that we are trying to turn some things around in the more depressed areas of our country. There are some other things that are somewhat time sensitive. But the main thing is we need to be investing more money at the same time that we are bringing down this deficit so that we'll be creating some jobs. The traditional economic theory is that if you reduce the deficit, you're going to slow down the economy and, and undermine the ability to create jobs. I just can convince that's wrong now because of the vast accumulated debt. If you can keep interest rates down, you're going to speed up the economy by putting more money out there. But I think the stimulus is important, and I intend to continue to support it. Is in the area that affects us. Isn't that what you've been warning against? That's not what they said. That's not what. Only one of them said that. I think that, um, I think that for one thing. The, the very fact that they're here supporting it, knowing that they'd all like changes in something that affects them, is, is the very point I've been trying to make to the American people. If you look at this, if you look at this, if every person looks at this through the mirror of what is best for you today, there will always be something in here that doesn't quite work. The thing that makes this work is that it is a package in which everybody foregoes something they would like and gets something that they would like but that in the main, it moves the country in the right direction. Yeah, go ahead. You know, Lod Cook started off by singling out the two provisions which uh, uh, you would expect uh, him to oppose in the old model, and he singled those out as things that he supported. And many of the others have said privately and publicly that they strongly support the package in spite of the fact that it contains elements that they would not like to necessarily single out by themselves, but as part of a package, it makes sense for the country. Would you be interested, would you be willing to put forth more spending cuts before your budget goes up? I know you've called upon the Republicans. I certainly, well, up. like what? Like what? I mean, unlike a lot of these other people, I worked for weeks and weeks and weeks on this budget. What I said was, if they had more spending cuts they thought were good ideas, I'd be happy to embrace them that I intended for the entire duration of my term here to continue to look for more spending cuts. If I find more that I think are worthy, I'll be glad to incorporate them. Uh, so I'm not, but, I, but I, let me just say, 
I, I have uh, a difficult time taking these people seriously who say we should have more spending cuts who were here for the last 12 years. Where were they? I mean, you know, I don't mind anybody can say whatever they want. Yes, go ahead. Let's But well, if we pass them, it'll be new. <laughs> That's right. They've been up there. If we pass them, they'll be new. Go ahead. You don't like, you obviously don't like to raise taxes. Are you ready to acknowledge at this point that you will have to go back to Congress and ask for more tax increases for the health care reform package? And would you also comment on a report that you dropped the idea of taxing benefits? Well, I, I haven't picked any tax up, so how could I drop? You can't drop something you didn't pick up. So I won't comment on something. If I pick something, I'll, t I'll tell you. I can say this. I'm not ready to admit that I think that the people who have paid the bill for health care in the 1980s should turn around and pay more right now. We're spending 14 percent of gross national product. You do have to find some way to recover some revenues to cover people who now don't have coverage if the government pays for the coverage. And that's an important part of stopping the cost shifting, which has led to so much increase in private insurance. But there are lots of options we are looking at now which wouldn't uh, necessarily increase middle class tax burdens. And there are, a whole, there are a whole range of options for dealing with this, which is why I ask you to uh, let us finish this process of review before we try to pick it apart. There, were, there was a huge transfer of wealth in America in the 1980s away from everything else to health care, to pay more for the same health care. Most of it went into paperwork, insurance costs, extra procedures by providers, and duplication of expensive equipment. And emergency care, partly due to the absence of primary and preventive care. If you correct all those things, that, and you don't change the present spending patterns, that will create a huge windfall to people whose pricing structures have all that built in. There are all kinds of things that we might be able to do to solve this problem, short of having health care become even more expensive for people who are paying 30 percent more for it than anybody else on earth. Well, I think health-related taxes are different. I think cigarette taxes, for example, are different. Why? Because I think that we are spending a ton of money in private insurance and in government tax payments to deal with the health care problems occasioned by bad health habits, and particularly smoking, which costing us a lot of money. Go ahead. Well, let me expand on this question. You, are there, what kind of cuts would you consider? I know you're, you're hearing a lot of input from press the importance of input. I haven't really been getting a lot of input. That's the thing. A lot of people keep talking about I haven't been getting a lot of specific input. A lot of folks say they want overall caps. Overall caps are another way of saying let's take Social Security benefits away from people even though Social Security is producing a $70 billion, $60 billion plus surplus in taxes. Or let's take Medicare benefits away from middle class Medicare beneficiaries instead of reforming the health care system. That's basically the only things I've heard since then. If somebody wants to come forward with something else specific. Now, there are some people who, to, let me just be also fair, some of the people in my party have been somewhat more specific about some of the cuts they want that I honestly disagree with, and there ought to be a debate on that in Congress. Some of them want me to cut defense more. I've already had to cut defense more than I pledged to do in the, in the campaign because it appears that the last budget which was adopted by Congress had defense cuts in it which weren't real. So I don't think I can cut any more right now. The Congress will be free to debate that. Some people think that we should abolish the superconducting super collider or end the space station program, but I honestly don't agree with that. I, I thought about those programs and I debated them, but at least those are specific and they can be debated on the floor of Congress. But these general cap this, blanket that, uh, I think people ought to say who they're, you know, what the cut is and who will be affected by it, and be very specific. Thank you.